tonight. Aid by air. Gaza struggles to stay whole as aid into the region continues to face delays at the border, with new approaches allowing for airdrops into the area. Hopes are high, but morale remains low. Haley halted. Without much surprise, Donald Trump sweeps up the Michigan primaries. But Nikki Haley vows to hold on and see the voting through despite getting dropped by big financial backers. Shady dealings. A friend in need is a friend indeed, as North Korea and Russia continue to keep up their unlikely alliance, with weapons production ramping up in the dictator nation to fuel Russia's onslaught in Ukraine. And heart to heart. One kindergarten teacher and her student share a heartfelt bond due to the most heart-wrenching circumstances. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. And good evening. You're joining us on World News this Wednesday night. It's the middle of the week and quite a few stories saw developments over the course of the day. So let's take you right to it. Starting off with our continued updates on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Egypt, Jordan, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar and France conducted an airdrop of food, medical supplies and other aid into Gaza amid warnings by aid agencies that the humanitarian situation on the ground is growing increasingly desperate. The UN says that just a trickle of the aid delivered by trucks across the Rafah border crossing with Egypt is getting through, with inspections by the Israeli military holding up the deliveries. A lifeline for Gaza falling from the sky. Crates filled with ready-made meals and badly needed medical supplies arriving by the tons. It's a joint effort between Jordan, France, Egypt, the United Arab Emirates and Qatar, who teamed up to load up cargo planes with aid, put them in the air, and then get supplies on the ground, where the situation grows more desperate by the day. Most humanitarian aid for Gaza comes through the Rafah border crossing with Egypt by truck. Although trucks are crossing the border, UN agencies say just a trickle of aid is getting to those who need it because of a cumbersome inspection process by the Israeli military. Israel says the inspections are needed for security reasons. Last week, the World Food Program paused food deliveries to northern Gaza, where it's estimated that one in six children are acutely malnourished. A UN report in December found that a quarter of Gaza's population, or about 570,000 people, are starving. The UN's humanitarian office says that all aid convoys into the north have been blocked by Israeli authorities in recent weeks, even convoys that were cleared in advance, something Israel has denied. And meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden easily won the Democratic presidential primary in Michigan, but a protest vote by Democrats angry over his support for Israel's war against Hamas in Gaza was growing as returns were counted. The protest vote was done by Democrats angry over his support for Israel's war and was showing signs of strength. I voted and committed because I think uh, uh, President Biden is not doing the right things. Please go and Many in Michigan's large Arab-American community who backed Biden in 2020, along with some progressive Democrats, are angry over Biden's support for Israel's offensive in Hamas-ruled Gaza, where tens of thousands of Palestinians have been killed. Democratic voters there were urged to mark their ballots as uncommitted in protest. Dearborn is a liberal city at the forefront of the opposition to Biden's Israel strategy. Dozens gathered at a party there after the primary. Six voters interviewed in Dearborn on Tuesday said they were voting uncommitted. But the broader impact of the movement on Biden's re-election run remains unclear. February polling shows that 61 percent of Democrats overall support Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas conflict. And in Michigan's largest city of Detroit, most Democrats interviewed said they would stick with Biden. Michigan offers an uncommitted option as a way of questioning whether a named candidate has the support of the party's base. With almost half of Democratic votes counted, Edison Research put the number of uncommitted voters at around 60,000, far exceeding the target of 10,000 that protest organizers had hoped for. 
However, election officials are not necessarily able to determine which uncommitted votes are protesting Biden's Gaza policy. In response to the opposition in Michigan, a senior Biden campaign official said, We're taking this seriously. The president himself has said repeatedly that he hears these demonstrators and that he thinks that their cause is important. Biden beat Trump by just a narrow margin here in the 2020 election. Prominent Michigan Democrats have warned that if voters abandon Biden, they could hand the swing state and the country back to Trump in November. And on the road to the White House tonight, there were no surprises as former President Donald Trump cruised to victory in the Michigan primaries, as Haley unfortunately lagged behind. Take a look. There were no surprises in either primary in Michigan as President Joe Biden and his predecessor Donald Trump comfortably won their respective races. But there were some signs of potential troubles ahead for each candidate in the perennial swing state. Donald Trump continued his clean sweep of primary wins as he once again brushed aside the challenge of former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. But Trump could face problems in November as he struggles to expand his voter base in this all-important state. Trump has two primaries later this week and next week he and Biden will each contest Super Tuesday, which this year will be a much subdued affair but there will still be plenty to mull over ahead of the presidential showdown in November. So Haley again failed to deliver the momentum-changing win that she needed, and her margins are shrinking rather than growing as time runs out. The Republican race is accelerating with more than one-third of the party's delegates at stake in next week's Super Tuesday contest, and 56% of its delegates set to be awarded by March 12th. And for an update on this situation, we have other than a world news special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Suzanne, we just had you report the process yesterday. How bad does does Nikki Haley have it in for her in Michigan? Well, Anurad, it is said that an underdog presidential contender's odds only grow longer as the race shifts out of the early voting states where retail politics make a difference and onto the national stage where money and momentum matter the most. Because many contests award delegates on a winner-take-all basis, close calls won't help Haley keep pace. And the outcome in Michigan was not a close call. Haley said that her goal in Michigan was to be as competitive as possible, but the former South Carolina governor hasn't yet made any state particularly competitive. With an 11-point loss in New Hampshire, the closest she's come to Trump. Haley's campaign sought to sell the Michigan results as a sign of the weakness of both Trump and Biden. However, results in the party's primaries and caucuses so far show that GOP voters aren't swayed by her argument that she's better positioned than Trump to beat Biden in November. That argument also fell flat in Michigan, where Haley pinned the GOP's loss of the governor's office and control of the legislature in recent years on Trump. Only 16 of Michigan's 55 delegates to the Republican National Convention were at stake in this primary. The rest will be awarded at a state party convention on Saturday. Back to you, Anravi. All right. Thank you very much once again for the continued updates. That was Other Than the World News special correspondent Suzanne Shanali from Toronto in Canada. Well, over now to the update on the war in Ukraine. French President Emmanuel Macron has faced uneasy reactions from European allies and a warning from the Kremlin after he refused to rule out the dispatch of Western ground troops to Ukraine in its fight against the Russian invasion. The Czech Republic and Poland are providing military aid to Ukraine, while Hungary and Slovakia say they won't send arms to Kyiv but are ready to contribute humanitarian or financial aid. The French president may not have ruled out sending troops to Ukraine one day, but that doesn't appear to be the case for a number of his European counterparts. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz agreed that allies would boost efforts to supply munitions to Kyiv, but sending troops was a red line. In a joint press conference, the Czech and Polish premiers were also categorical. The NATO chief also said the alliance has no plans to put troops on the ground in Ukraine, Neither does Sweden, which is set to join NATO. 
A spokesperson for the British Prime Minister said the UK wasn't planning a large-scale deployment beyond the small number of personnel already in Ukraine supporting their armed forces. For Ukraine, though, just the fact that the possibility of direct military intervention was discussed at the meeting of leaders on Monday was good news. The Kremlin, on the other hand, warned that if European members of NATO sent in troops, a conflict between the alliance and Russia would become inevitable. Emmanuel Macron said on Monday that although no consensus existed on sending troops, European countries had to do whatever it takes to ensure that Russia did not win the war. And on the Russian front, the unlikely allies continue to stick it through. As North Korea has reportedly sent close to 7,000 containers of weapons to Russia for use against Ukraine. This is according to South Korea's defense chief. In return, the regime is allegedly receiving much-needed necessities from Moscow, like food. North Korea is allegedly operating some of its munitions factories at full capacity to supply Russia with weapons. Speaking to reporters on Monday, South Korea's defense minister Shin Won-shik said that some of North Korea's arms factories are operating at 30 percent capacity due to the shortage of raw materials, but others are now operating at full capacity to supply weapons to Russia. The defense chief said that over the past six months, the regime has shipped some 6,700 containers to Russia. This works out at approximately 3 million rounds of 152mm artillery shells or 500,122mm artillery shells. Shin also assessed that cruise missiles launched five times this year alone by the North are likely to be exported to Russia as well. In exchange for weapons, North Korea is reportedly receiving food from Russia to stabilize its food prices. According to Shin, Russia has sent approximately 30% more containers to North Korea than those shipped the other way. The North is widely anticipated to have received satellite technology from Moscow as well, but the defense minister expressed skepticism, saying that it's showing no signs of functioning and is merely orbiting the Earth and not carrying out any sort of reconnaissance activities. After two failures last year, North Korea succeeded in launching its first spy satellite into orbit last November. Shin hinted at the possibility of North Korea launching its next reconnaissance satellite before South Korea launches another of its own from Florida in early April. Amid escalating tensions on the Korean peninsula, the defense chief reiterated that South Korea will never strike first, but will maintain a firm defense posture to counter North Korea's provocations immediately, powerfully, and to the end. Let's go in for a short commercial break. We'll be right back with more key regional stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back. We have some updates for you now in our region of Asia. A civilian team from India has reached Maldives to take charge of one of three aviation platforms in Maldives ahead of the March 10th deadline for the withdrawal of Indian military personnel from the island nation. Quoting a statement by Maldives Defense Ministry, the local media in the region reported that the civilian team to operate and maintain the aircraft arrived in Addu early last night to complete the takeover process. Test flights will be held today before the helicopter is taken to India for repairs. Further quoting the Defence Ministry statement, it said the Indian troops will withdraw from the Maldives on the dates agreed upon by the two countries. The development comes days after the Maldivian President Mohammad Musu announced his maiden address to the parliament that the first group of Indian military personnel will be sent back from the island nation before 10th of March. The remaining Indians man in the two aviation platforms will be withdrawn by 10th of March according to the agreement between the two countries. There are 88 military personnel man in the three Indian platforms that have been providing humanitarian and medical evacuation services to the people of the Maldives for the last few years using the two helicopters and the Dornier aircraft. Soon after taking the oath as the president on November 17th, Musu formally requested India to withdraw the military personnel from his country, saying the Maldivian people had given him a strong mandate to make this request to New Delhi. We're over in China now as the country's property crisis has taken yet another turn for the worst. And giant developer Country Garden is the latest to face a liquidation petition. The firm relieved the news today and it said the petition was filed by creditors over non-payment of a loan worth $25 million. Country Garden says it will resolutely oppose the move with a court date set for May 17th. 
but the petition will revive concern among homebuyers and investors over the country's ailing property sector. It comes just a month after big arrival Evergrande was ordered to liquidate by a Hong Kong court. A string of other developers have also defaulted on their debt payments. The sector has lurched from one crisis to another since 2021, when regulators cracked down on the massive debts being piled up at property firms. Now it's all a growing headache for Beijing, with real estate accounting for around a quarter of China's economy. Country Garden says it will continue to work with creditors on a restructuring plan. In October, it missed a $15 million debt payment, prompting groups of bondholders to start organising action against the firm. One investor told the company had messed around and wasted time ever since, and said it was no surprise if some creditors had now run out of patience. We're in Indonesia now, following the chaos of the elections, the depressing reality has begun to sunk in for the nation's nearly 300 million population. It used to be a cheap staple ingredient, but rice now is getting even more expensive. And that's a problem for many people in Asia, not just Indonesia. In the suburbs of Indonesia's capital city in particular, shoppers face long lines to secure subsidized supplies. One woman says there will be uproar if prices go any higher. Rice is the centre of nearly every meal here. But costs for the grain have jumped close to 16-year highs after India, the world's top supplier, restricted exports last year amid tight supplies. The El Nino weather phenomenon has also reduced rainfall across much of Asia, hitting output of cereals. That has sparked inflation for many foodstuffs, with rice up 16% over the past year. Indonesia's government has stepped in to help shoppers. At this state-subsidized market, rice sells for around a quarter less than normal. An official says that's a response to local demands, with people saying rice is increasingly expensive and hard to find. The market limits sales to two sacks per person to stop hoarding. Almost 430 such facilities were set up just in January, with another 300 or so planned by the end of February. Indonesia also looks set to import around record quantities of rice this year. While that may help with supplies, it could also drive prices yet higher. Asia's hard-pressed cooks could find that feeding their families is going to get even more expensive. We're in the UK now with some tragic news. Thomas Kingston, husband of Lady Gabriella Kingston and son-in-law of Prince and Princess Michael of Kent, has died at the age of 45. The Buckingham Palace has just announced this. He was found dead at an address in Gloucester with emergency services called to the scene. For more on this, we have other than the world news special correspondent Clifford Pereira from Yorkshire in the UK. For more, Clifford. Yes, I'm right. There was no suspicious circumstances and no one else was involved. King Charles and Queen Camilla sent their most heartfelt thoughts and prayers to his family. A statement from Miss Kingston's widow, Lady Gabriella and his family issued by Buckingham Palace paid tribute to Mr. Kingston. The death was described as a great shock to the whole family. A Buckingham Palace spokesman said the King Charles and Queen Camilla joined Prince and Princess Michael of Kent and all those who knew him in a grieving in a much loud member of the family. Gloucestershire police said it was called by the ambulance service to an address in the Cots walls. The force said the death is not being treated as suspicious and a file will be prepared for the corona. An inquest is expected to be held. Back to you, Anradi. All right, thank you very much. That was Other Than the World News Special Correspondent Clifford Pereira from Yorkshire in the UK. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. When faced with a dire situation, hope is the most important feeling. 
and the feeling of hope is often easier to come by when you are going through crisis together. Well, at a certain kindergarten, a teacher-student bond was uniquely formed in a heart-wrenching backdrop. But the outcome is the opposite of heartache. Take a look. At Lake Highland Preparatory School in Orlando. Fan. You have to think about this one. Kennedy Vaught and her kindergarten teacher, Carlene Honor, share a special bond. That journey includes something they have in common. Both are heart surgery survivors. Kennedy had hers at Advent Health less than a year ago. Thank you, guys. We have all set. So when it came time for her to start kindergarten, Mom Kristen was overjoyed to discover Mrs. Honor knew just what Kennedy was going through. All right. Mrs. Honor, who had her surgery five years ago, says she's teaching Kennedy that their scars are a sign of strength and courage. We just call each other heart twins. And one of the things I wanted Kennedy to know was that the scar was a reminder, a blessing, and not to let it stop her from doing the things that she wanted to achieve. Can you do a split? Kennedy is now back doing gymnastics. Give me an A! And wants to be a cheerleader. Give me a T! We're walking for you, girl. And together they teamed up for the Greater Orlando Heart Walk. For Mrs. Honor, it was a powerful reminder about just how lucky she is to be alive. And finally tonight, there are times when some of us wish we were born as our pets. They are fed nothing but the best and are given the royal treatment simply for existing. Well, tonight we have for you the story of a peculiar creature that most would agree deserves a very good pampering. Meet Millie. Millie is a puggle, or as veterinarians would say, an echidna. Animal experts at Taronga Wildlife Hospital in Australia believe Millie is an orphan. Millie was found back in the middle of November. She was just discovered on her own without her mother. We estimate her age at about 35 days when she came in, which at that age she should have still been in mum's pouch. So something's happened to mum which has made her drop the puggle. We don't know what because we, we never found mum. As with a new baby of any species, keepers have taken care of Millie around the clock. She's a pretty good housemate. She's uh, fairly well behaved. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm going to miss her when she's uh, no longer with me. Zookeepers plan to release Millie into the wild at around one year old. Due to overhunting and the loss of their natural habitats, echidna are considered critically endangered, making the sound of Millie slurping just a little more joyful. Well, it sure will be nice to be reborn as a puggle next time. Well, that's all the stories we have for you tonight. We'll see you again next time with more updates on the happenings of the world. Have a good night.